Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at BetterHelp.com slash Nerdery and Murdery. That's BetterHelp.com forward slash Nerdery and Murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. You're listening to the sweet and sensual sounds of Nerdery and Murdery. Seriously, you're an idiot. Welcome to episode 58 of Nerdery and Murdery. Ep 58, peoples. I'm Zig with your Nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your Murdery. Welcome again to another week of our podcast. Uh, fresh off my first two-parter, I have hopefully have quenched my thirst by now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that two-parter was kind of enjoyable. I, I, yeah, I did too. I enjoyed researching it, you know, as again, as much as I can enjoy researching horrific, horrible crimes, death and dismemberment. Yes. So with that, I will turn over the show to you, Zig, for the nerdery side of the house. Well, awesome. Today we are talking about the third doctor, John Pertwee. Excellent. So, you know what, actually, before we start on that, um, I do want to remind everybody to go over to Two Geeks and a Microphone because Zig did a little guest spottery uh, over yes. on their show. So he he got to do a deep dive into Doctor Who for for them. Yes. So make sure to check that out. Um uh, and uh, sorry about that interruption. I'll let you. Take no, 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 no. Actually, I was going to say, I, I, I just did some stuff on John Pertwee uh, recently, but it, at this point, it would have been like 10 weeks ago. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, John Pertwee is best known for his portrayal as the third doctor on BBC science fiction television series, Doctor Who. 
Uh, he was there from 1970 to 1974. He was also the first to play the role following the transition of BBC One from black and white to color. Um, his 60-year uh, entertainment career included work at radio, film, and cabaret. This was despite uh, the inauspicious beginnings of having been thrown out of drama school as a young man and told he had no future as an actor. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so John Pertwee was born uh, John um, uh, Devin Roland Pertwee, uh, which was an anglicized version of his true family name, uh, Perthius de Lallevault. Uh and he was born in 1919 in the Chelsea area of London. He was the second son of a famous playwright, painter, and actor, Roland Pertwee, and his actress wife, uh, Avis. His writer brother, Michael Pertwee, be, uh, being three years his senior, uh, the Pertwee family had a long connection with show business and the performing arts. And it was at Wellington House Preparatory School in Westgate-on-Sea in Kent that John, and a, uh, as a small and rebellious child, was encouraged uh, in the direction. Later at uh, Fresham Heights Coeducational School, John had his first taste of the real theater when, with real women in the school stage production of Twelfth Night and Lady Princess Stream. In 36, he, had, he auditioned for and was accepted by the Royal Academy or, or, of Dramatic Arts, or RADA. Uh, he was later kicked out for refusing to play the part uh, of the wind in a play. <laughs> Um, and John Pertwee unfortunately passed away on 20th of May, 1996, of a heart attack. The BBC announced his death. He was survived by his his wife, uh, Ingerborg uh, Roessa, and his son Sean Pertwee. Sean Pertwee played uh, Alfred in the uh, Gotham series. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Sean Pertwee in Gotham actually looks like John Pertwee did when he was playing Doctor Who. Hmm. especially the first first season he did it if you go back and watch some of the stuff from gotham it's like oh my god he looks jake because i never thought he looked like his dad until until i saw him in that and i was like oh my god he looks just like john pertwee um they were also he was also survived by by his uh his daughter dariel pertwee uh who is a, an accomplished stage actress so Pertwee was kind of big in uh, uh, as a stage actor. Um, he also did a lot of radio work. Um, a show called, I believe it was called uh, Dad's Army. Um, and he was also in the Navy in the Second World War. And there was a naval radio drama that uh, that he did for a long time. And I, it was hard for me to find the notes on that. I'm sorry. But uh, that's what he was most known for. And then they cast him as the third doctor to follow uh, Patrick Troughton. Mm -hmm. um, basically, ty or, uh, casting him against type because, you know, Patrick Troughton was a small, you know, dark haired kind of, you know, kind of small man. And John Pertwee's a big guy mm -hmm. or was a big guy, big, broad kind of tall broad shoulders and the idea was we're going to cast against type and they continued to do that for quite a while after uh after pertwee they went with a much younger guy who was kind of goofy tom baker um is per who, is pertwee the one that had the riddler cane no oh okay. no th that's uh um oh my god sylvester mccoy Sorry, okay. the man's name just yeah flew out my brain. Okay, just trying to visualize Pertwee. Yes, uh, Pertwee was the one that wore the uh, the velvet dinner jackets with the ruffle shirts. Okay, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I've got him now. Uh, um, yeah, um, and you know, always looked kind of cool and very kind of you know late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies, but also nineteen twenties. It was weird because I know at one point Pertwee said that. The first jacket he wore as, as Doctor Who actually belonged to his grandfather. Sounds like uh, Capaldi took a lot off of Pertwee. Yeah. Yeah. Capaldi did take a lot off of uh, Pertwee, even the way he did his hair. Mm -hmm. um, so the third Doctor, uh, of course, is the protagonist of the long-running BBC science fiction series Doctor Who. Um, 
in the series uh, narrative, the Doctor is a century, centuries-old alien Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey who travels in time and space in the TARDIS, frequently with companions. Uh, at the end of his life, the Doctor regenerates. Consequently, both the physical appearance and personality of the Doctor change. Now, Pertwee played the Doctor as a dapper man of action in stark contrast with the uh, – uh, with uh, – Patrick Troughton, who was who was more keen to you know running away, mm-hmm. Pertwee stood and fought. Uh, Pertwee fought a lot in uh, what he called the Venusian karate, mm-hmm. but it was you know it was mostly pressure points and things. It was it wasn't about hurting your uh, your opponent as much as it was disabling them, right? Not allowing them to fight. So you get to see a lot of that stuff. In part, he was trying to play like a James Bond type character because the BBC, their idea was, OK, we're going to strand the doctor on Earth for a few years and let him do some like James Bondish stuff because it was 1970 and that's what was popular. So it's like, yeah, we'll 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 leave the aliens and stuff or we'll make it more like uh, like James Bond or uh, Sapphire and Steel or some other things that, are, that were around at the time where you had a science fiction tone, but it was still Earthbound. Um, so his initial companions, uh, companion is unit scientist, Liz Shaw. The opening of his first episode is Liz Shaw getting hired by Brigadier, uh, Lethbridge Stewart mm-hmm. played by, again, the wonderful Nicholas Courtney. Um, uh, Liz Shaw got replaced by the more wide eyed, uh, Joe Grant played by Katie Manning. Oh, uh, Liz Shaw was played with Carolyn Johns. Sorry. And she continued to accompany the doctor uh, after he regained the use of his TARDIS. But uh, Katie uh, Katie Manning got tired of doing the show and didn't want to get typecast. So she was replaced by a journalist uh, named Sarah Jane Smith, who was Liz Sladen. Liz Sladen was the longest running companion the doctor's ever had. Right. She did three and a half seasons. Plus, plus her own show. Plus her own show. Uh, she actually had a pilot back in 1980 called Canine and Company, mm-hmm. which they ran the pilot, but it got bad ratings because it happened. Um, it, it aired the same time as uh, Re- Reagan's attempted assassination. Uh. Yeah. So. Um, oh, I guess that was 1981. Sorry. Well, they filmed it in 1980 and they broadcast it in 1981. But yeah. It was right around the time of Reagan's assassination. It aired, which is funny because the original Doctor Who first episode aired three days after Kennedy was assassinated. Right, I remember you saying that. Yeah. Did um, Did Canine come about during Pertwee, or is that Tom Baker? Tom Baker. Okay. Tom Baker. I, Sarah wasn't even with Canine uh, in the series. Uh, in 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 the Canine and Company storyline, Sarah gets a box from the Doctor, opens it, and there's a there's a, a version of canine in the box. Um, and so she spends all her time with canine supposedly after that. And that's when she gets her own show. Canine is still around, but they didn't use him very much because the canine also got his own show, uh, which was a children's television show that only ran like two seasons. And I want to say it was just called canine. Um, it wasn't very good. It only ran like 10 episodes, like five, five, of the first season, five, of the second season. Right. It wasn't nearly as good as the Sarah Jane. Crew, which was great. Um, which Liz, uh, Liz Sladen did until she passed away. Um, but yeah, her first, her first season was with, uh, John Pertwee. As a matter of fact, it was the time warrior, uh, which is the first time we got to meet the Santarans. Um, it was great, and you also got Jeremy Bullock in that episode dressed as Robin Hood. Really? Yes, yes. Jeremy the Robin Bullock. Hood character in that film, the the Archer, who who who's in the green outfit, that's Jeremy Bullock. For those who don't know, Jeremy Bullock goes on to play Boba Fett. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But yes, he, he was a he was an Archer in this episode, and he talks a lot. He has a lot of speaking lines, so. He's not a bad actor. That's what I've heard. He's not Tamora Morrison good. 
but he's not bad. Especially for Doctor Who in the early 70s. Yeah, he's still the original, so. Um, but yeah, you can, if you see that episode of Doctor Who, you realize that they didn't use his voice when they said, he's no good to me dead. Because not the same voice at all. Um, the third Doctor was suave, dapper, and technologically oriented. So the Doctor would build these gadgets or use these gadgets. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was Venusian Aikido. Not Venusian karate. Uh, but the doctor was a scientist and he had a lab with unit and he would make these little gadgets and sometimes they would just be nonsense. It'd be like a bunch of cutlery and 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 pieces of metal and little wire string together with a teacup and it was like, that's not that's not real. That's not but you know, it's what the BBC had on hand. Um so he was unit scientific advisor because he was stuck on the planet. And occasionally the Tom Lords would send him on co covert missions uh, where he would, he would do work for them. He would be like a mediator at a planet or in probably one of the best old Doctor Who episodes, uh, The Mutants. He was sent by the Celestial Intervention Agency, the CIA. Uh, to uh, help with the transition of power from this one planet that was uh, that was colonized by by people from Earth, uh, and the the people were were suffering from this weird mutation. It turns out that the mutation wasn't actually a mutation at all. Uh, it was what was supposed to happen to them because of the way their their planet revolved around their sun. Um, they would change forms uh, like a metamorphosis. And there was an, actually a third form that they had as well, but they hadn't seen that there because the metamorphosis, um, the planets takes five. Uh, each season is 500 years, so it takes 2000 years for the planet to revolve around its sun. So they'd only seen the regular people for the 500 years, and then they had just slipped into the fall period of the planet where, where they turned into these weird scary looking mutants but still intelligent still human beings uh to survive this radiation that uh that this pelted this planet gets pelted by for 500 years and then they transform into another form which is um uh, what i like to refer to as the hippie butterfly nice because that's what it was it was a hippie butterfly um which is really advanced and then they go back to being just regular humans after after that period is over. So, um, but it, it it takes place in the midst of all of that, and the humans don't understand because they've been there two hundred years and they haven't seen this change up until recently. Um, but it's a fascinating episode and really really good uh, work with John Pertwee. Um, Katie Manning is really good in this, of course, uh, and the special effects for the the amount of budget that they had. Mm -hmm. are really really good the costuming is phenomenal because these people are kind of backward i guess you could say but they're they're dressed as is like warlords and war chiefs and I, it's fascinating um well is this in today is this getting about the time for blake seven as well no 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 oh, blake okay. seven hasn't happened yet yeah, but you will recognize some of the outfits that get used in Blake 7 later on. Right, right. I knew it led into that. I just didn't remember if we were too early for, for yeah, Blake 7 is, or not. This is still a few years uh, ahead of Blake 7. Uh, Blake 7 happened after Star Wars. Okay. Uh, this okay. is still about 73. I think the Mutants was in either 72 or 73, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. It wasn't the last season, but it was because it was still Katie Manning. Because his last season was with uh, Elizabeth Sladen. Right. Um, but no, I, if you're going to watch, you're just like, if you're only going to watch one John Pertwee storyline, watch the mutants. Mm. It's really, really good. He's got some other really, really great ones, but the mutants is stands out. Um, the time warrior also stands out. That's a great one, but it, John Pertwee encapsulated that role much as everybody else did. But in his own way, 
Um, he went on to do another uh, children's series called Wurzel Gummidge, which is like a British Mary Poppins type figure. Okay. Or like an Annie McPhee mm-hmm. kind of figure um, that most people in England know him by because after he did Doctor Who, he did Wurzel Gummidge for like 10 years. Oh, wow. They make these little movies and and that's what the most of the English public knows him as. So while Tom Baker was doing Doctor Who, John Perry was doing oh, Wurzel Gummidge. So in general, this incarnation of the Doctor was more physically daring than the previous two and was the first to confront an enemy physically uh, if cornered. Um, this often took the form of a quick strike with the occasional joint lock or throw. As I said, not really there to hurt the person, just to keep him off of him. Uh, it was usually enough to get himself and anyone accompanying him out of immediate danger, uh, but usually not to the extent of a brawl. In keeping with the doctor's nonviolent nature, uh, he only used his fighting skills if he had to. Uh, Generally, he just disarmed his opponents rather than knocking them unconscious. Uh, his martial prowess was such that a single sudden strike was usually enough to halt whatever threatened him. And at one point, he reminded Captain Yates of Unit, uh, physically as well as verbally, that Yates would have a difficult time removing them from somewhere if he did not want to be removed. So, <laughs> Doctor, I'll make you leave. You'll have a difficult time doing that, Captain Yates. Huh? Uh, you also get, again, Mike Yates, uh, which was played by the same actor all through John Pertwee and part of Tom Baker, as well as um, Sergeant Benton, who eventually, I think, rose to the rank of – I think he eventually became a captain. So started as uh, Corporal Benton, then Sergeant Benton, then Sergeant Major Benton, then uh, Officer Benton, and then eventually – you know, Captain Benton. So you got to see uh, John Leeson, I believe was the actor's name, uh, make a rise through this. And, and that guy had a paying gig for like 12 years. It was awesome. So as I said, they were the first ones to be broadcast in color. So again, the first season, the stories are good. Um, the special effects are the special effects of Doctor Who. The costuming was fine. They had a hard time doing cinematography in color because they weren't used to it. Right. They were just understanding how the cameras worked because they work differently. Um, there's also some issues with sound uh, because the PAL format uh, transmits sound a little differently than like our NTSC. So what that translates to is once they go into color, the Doctor Who episodes that broadcast here, the music would be really loud and the dialogue volume would be really low. So you'd turn it up so you could hear what they were saying, and then you'd get this, bum, bum, bum. It was kind of off-putting. But that's not because they produced it wrong. It was because the PAL format being converted into NTSC, which is what we use over here, um, which were broadcasting formats. Um, There's a problem with the sound quality. It doesn't translate well. Whereas the audio, the the dialogue track is at a lower volume than the audio track, and they had that problem up until we went to digital, you know, digital signaling where we didn't have to we didn't have to have two separate formats anymore. A catchphrase used during the Doctor's era was a "reverse the polarity of the neutron flow." You get that a lot. They even made a, an alliteration to it in the 50th anniversary where they're both pointing their, the two doctors are both pointing their sonic screwdrivers at a vortex and they're reversing the polarity. And David Tennant looks over at Matt Smith and goes, well, it's the same. See, I'm reversing it and you're reversing mine, which kicks it back to the way it was. And Matt Smith's like, Oh yeah, you're right. But yeah, that first started with, uh, with that doctor. Um, Terrence Dix, um, who was, I believe, the script editor at the time, recalls that he used the line in a script, and Pertwee approached him about the line. Dix had feared he would have to remove it, but Pertwee stated he liked it and wanted to do more of it. So every time Terrence Dix would 
had the chance to put one of those in there, he did. Um, the thir- third doctor only said the full phrase, reverse the polarity of the neutron flow twice on screen in the Sea Devils and the Five Doctors uh, 20th anniversary special. Pertwee used the phrase when he acted in the stage play Doctor Who, The Ultimate Adventure in 1989. Uh, when Colin Baker took over the role in the play, he amended the line to reverse the linearity of the proton flow because, you know, Colin Baker didn't want to step on uh, John Pertwee's toes. Right. And John Pertwee was really the first to start getting the rest of them to do conventions and things like that. Hmm. He was like, you guys have got to come on because they were they were in a small club. Right. Um, the only one who really didn't do it was Tom Baker because Tom Baker did the Doctor Who for seven years, and when he was done, he was done. He didn't. He he had trouble being typecast for a long time after that. Yes, he did a Sherlock Holmes shortly after that, which was really good. If you've never seen Tom Baker's Sherlock Holmes and Hounds of the Baskervilles, you should check it out. Yeah, I uh, agree. Agree. I've yeah. seen it. Yeah, he did some other stuff. Uh, mostly, uh, mostly commercial work because he didn't want to be typecast, and that's why he didn't do a lot of the stuff. But John Pertwee was able to get Patrick Troughton and uh, Peter Davison, Colin Baker, um, Sylvester McCoy to do a bunch of those those things um, while he was still alive. He also wrote a book. Um, he wrote a book about his life because he thought it was fascinating. And so did other people. So he uh, he wrote a book, and it was called Moon Boots and Dinner Suits. And they used to give it away during pledge drives at our local P- KERA station. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. There was a part one, which took him all the way up to the war, and part two was when he did Doctor Who. Um, but yeah, it's a picture of him standing on a beach in a in his full doctor who dinner jacket regalia and a pair of uh moon boots you know the ski boots they used to wear Uh uh-huh yeah in silver that's funny standing on a beach yeah it's pretty awesome um he was also kind of popular with some of the novelizations you know when they would do the novelization the doctor they always like to do the pertwee area because they thought the unit thing was kind of a fascinating story to kind of work around um, he does get the TARDIS back um, after the 10th anniversary episode where he can use the TARDIS and go around. Um, and he again appeared again in the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors, broadcasting in 1983. And a stage play, The Doctor Who, The Ultimate Adventure, was produced in 1989 that John Pertwee did for uh, two or three years. And Colin Baker took it over in 1993. Um, he also reprised his role in the 30th anniversary charity special Dimensions in, in Time. Um, I do not talk about Dimensions in Time very often because it wasn't good. They did a 30th anniversary special where they crossed over with uh, actors from a soap opera. I want to say it was EastEnders, but I could be wrong. Um, and it's not good. It just huh. isn't. Um, there'll be a doctor and one of their companions walking along and talking. And we're like, oh, no, there's a time shift. And then it switches to another doctor and another companion having the same conversation. Okay. They did it as a charity event because Doctor Who had been off the air for a few years. Right. Um, and then they did one with uh, a few years later with uh, Rowan Atkinson which was basically a joke, but it was probably the best thing that they'd done for Doctor Who in, in several years. Uh, Dimensions in Time, it's one of those things, if you're a Doctor Who fan, you should watch it. It's only like 20 minutes long, but it's not good. Mm. You do get to see everybody, which is nice. Tom Baker even reprised his role for that. Um, he was sitting on a chair in a studio, but that's basically it. Um, it's not great. Um, I was sorely disappointed as a fan, mm-hmm. uh, and I waited years to see it because it didn't broadcast over here. Because uh, it was a charity show, 
uh, that they did on the BBC and they didn't release it on videotape or anything else. Cause it was only 20 minutes long. I ended up seeing a copy of a copy that someone had recorded that gotten a chance to, to, to see one. And, uh, and, and I was underwhelmed because I, it was like 1995 when I saw it. And I, I hadn't seen any Dr. Who in years or new Dr. Who because Dr. Dr. Who ended in 1989. Right. Um, so yeah, it is it's worth it to see it. Um now from 2015, Big Finish Audio produced a new series of audio dramas adventures featuring the third doctor titled The Third Doctor Adventures with Tim Trelore voicing the role. And I can say that that Tim Trelore who voices the role, I've heard some of it. He sounds like uh he sounds like John Pertwee. He sounds a little more like John Pertwee than Sean Pertwee does. And Sean Pert, we inherited his dad's voice. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, he just has a different tone and affectation. But that is about it for the third doctor, other than you guys should go out there and watch it. It is on BritBox, uh, which you can buy as an extension to your Amazon. I think it's only like four bucks. Um, go back and watch the mutants if you don't watch anything else now granted i say that mutants is like three hours long watch it in blocks um i think Tubi. it's either Tubi or imdb tv which is now free tv Mm -hmm. uh also has a doctor who channel where they show classic doctor who all day you don't get to pick it you just watch whatever's on that's interesting Uh, yeah oh yeah but they run they run stuff from pertwee baker Davidson, Colin Baker, and Sylvester McCoy. So interesting. You're liable to see any of it. I don't think they show, I haven't seen any of the black and white. No, that's not true. No, I've seen some Trouton ones. Yeah. So they show all of the original series. Definitely put a link for that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's really cool. Um, I can't remember when it's on, but yeah, I know. I, Cause I'll just put it on just to have it in the background. Nothing sure. Else. Right. It's like, oh, I've seen that one. I've seen that one recently. But if you want to go and select it, BritBox has BritBox even has the lost episodes mm-hmm. um, where they've got the audio, but they've only got like stills or some animation. So you can actually see it, but mostly hear it. Um, and some of the Pertwee episodes. Now, there are a couple of Pertwee episodes where they threw away some of the color copies. So they will be. Um, I'm thinking of. Doctor Who and the Silurians, mm-hmm. which is the title of the episode. It's the only one they've ever titled that way. Um, it's, it, it was broadcast in color, but they also recorded it in black and white uh, for cheese markets. Um, most of the episodes in color, two of them are in black and white because that's all they've got. Right. So it'll be color, 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 black and white, color, 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 black and white. Interesting. But yeah, the the mutants is full color. They've actually cleaned it up a little bit because it's it's kind of celebrated as one of the best episodes out there. And yeah, watch the mutants. Very interesting. Um, I, I'm I'm I love going through this uh, through this progression path with you because the next doctor we're getting to is going to be Tom Baker, which yes. I was way more familiar with. So cool. He played, he played here on KERA a lot. Yeah. He started with Tom Baker. They went Tom Baker, Peter Davidson. They went back to John Pertwee, showed him, then showed Tom Baker again. They showed Tom Baker his whole run five or six times. Oh, sure. Years to do it. Yeah, that was the common that was the common one to see way back then. So, oh yeah, awesome, great stuff as usual. Uh, well, thank you, sir. Then with that, uh, we'll go over to the murdery side of the house. Murder. For my episode today, I got my information off all that's interesting. Wikipedia, ABC News 10, Keddy Case Cabin 28, People Magazine, and Historic Mysteries. And today we're going to be covering the Keddy Cabin Murders. The Keddy Cabin Murders. So in July of 1979, Glenna Susan Sue Sharp, along with her five children, left her home in Connecticut after separating from her abusive husband, James Sharp. 
She had decided to relocate to Northern California, where her brother Don was residing at the time. And upon arriving in California, she began renting a small trailer formerly occupied by her brother at the Claremont Trailer Village in Quincy. Uh, Sue's ex-husband was in the military when they divorced, and the Navy gave her $250 a month to start her new life. She also worked. What year was this again? 1979. Okay. Um, she also worked a part-time job at the Quincy Elks Lodge, and with the little money she brought in, she had decided to move out of the trailer, and she rented Kitty Cabin 28 in the fall of 1981. Over the next few months, Sue worked hard to turn their new mountain community into a permanent home for her children. The house was much larger than the trailer was, and had become available when Plumas County's then Sheriff Sylvester D- uh, Douglas Thomas moved out. She resided in the cabin with her 15-year-old son, John, her 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, her 12-year-old daughter, Tina, and her two younger sons, Rick and Greg, who were age 10 and 5, respectively. Johnny took an unfinished room downstairs off the small utility area in the partial basement, um, and with no internal stairwell or bathroom, he used the back stairs of the front door to access the main cabin, but was otherwise quite happy with his relative independence. That's the, what did you say, 16-year-old? Uh, Johnny is the oldest, yeah, the 14. 14, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, 15, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, 14, 15. 15. 15-year-old has their own room that you have to go down some stairs and go around the front door to get to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll bet he did. Absolutely. The younger... 1981, I bet it was covered with black light posters, too. <laughs> The younger boys, Rick and Greg, shared a bedroom at the front of the cabin adjacent to the living room, while Sue and her youngest daughter, Tina, shared the rear bedroom opposite the kitchen. In mid-February, the eldest daughter, Sheila, joined the family after giving birth to a baby in Oregon, which was swiftly put up for adoption by Sue. At that time, Sue slept in the twin bed while the girls shared the queen, or sometimes Sue slept on the pull-out couch in the living room by the TV. Um, times were not easy in Plumas. Um, they they once were, but uh, but Sue had to make ends meet with the 250 she received from the Navy, which just covered the rent, food stamps and other social welfare, and the stipend she received from being enrolled in CETA, which was a federal program of the era. Sue had been described as a quiet, reserved woman who primarily kept herself, but her family was integrating well. The children were attending school in Quincy, and they were making friends. On April 11th, 1981, around 11.30 a.m., Sue, Sheila, and Greg drove from the residence of their friends, uh, the Meeks family, to pick up Rick, who was attending baseball tryouts at Ganser Field in Quincy. They happened upon John and his friend Dana Hall Wingate hitchhiking at the mouth of the canyon from Quincy to Ketty and picked them up, then driving about six miles away to Ketty. Two hours later, around 3.30 p.m., John and Dana hitchhiked back to Quincy, where they had plans to visit friends. Around this time, the two were seen in the city's downtown area. Sue had urged them not to hitchhike, but passersby uh, spotted John and Dana on the street corner trying to flag a ride home about 9 to t- 9.30 to 10 that evening. That same evening, Sheila had had plans to spend the night with the Seabolt family, who lived in an adjacent home, while Sue remained at home with Rick, Greg, and the boy's young friend, Justin Smart. Uh, Sheila departed uh, house number 28 shortly after 8 o'clock p.m., leaving her mother alone with the younger children. Tina, who had been watching television at the Seabolt residence, returned home to number 28 around 9.30 p.m. after Sheila arrived at the Seabolt's to spend the night. I know this is a lot of back and forth. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, but you got five kids. It's not that, you know, they run around. I can't tell you how many times uh, Ella has stayed here or Lorelai has stayed over uh, Randy and Ashley's just all weekend long, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right. Well, on Sunday morning, April 12th, 1981, Sheila Sharp woke up uh, next door at cabin 28, again, where she had spent the night. And she had decided to attend church with them that morning. So at about 7.45 a.m., she went to her cabin, which was 15 feet to the south, so she could get her Sunday clothes. Upon opening the door, she saw three bodies on the floor, the furthest covered with a blanket. She also saw a knife on the floor between the doorway and the closest body bent at such an angle she mistook it for an open pocket knife. And she then ran screaming back to the sea bolts, as you imagine she would. Oh, yeah. 
this was during a time where most people didn't have phones. So Sheila and Mrs. Siebel went to the nearest working phone, which was across the street at the landlord's cabin, which was 25. And they called the Pluma County Sheriff's Office. Wait, wait, wait. What year? This was 1981. 1981. Uh, most people had phones, but I imagine they sounds like they were they were working pretty hard to, to make ends meet. And it was cabins out in the woods. Oh, yeah, that's true. So not as many phones are going to be out there cabins in the woods. Yeah, I think that's kind of the point. Um, All three victims had been bound with medical tape and electrical cord. Tina was absent from the home while the three younger children, Rick, Greg, and Justin, were unharmed in an adjacent bedroom. Uh, Initial reports stated that the three young boys had slept through the incident, incident, though this was later contradicted. Upon discovering the scene, Sheila again, she rushed back to the Seabolt's house, uh, whereupon Jamie Seabolt retrieved Rick, Greg, and Justin through the bedroom window. So didn't want to pull them out through the main room, of course. No, no, no. Uh, No, uh, actually, good man, Jamie. mm -hmm. He later admitted to having briefly entered the home through the back door to see if anyone was still alive, potentially contaminating evidence of the process. Yeah, but again, I can't get down on that dude trying to save kids. No, not at all. No, not 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 putting down Jamie at all for this one. No, no, no. Um, due to the chaos surrounding uh, all the events, it took police quite a few hours before anyone realized that Tina was nowhere to be found. There were some blood stains on her bedding, which suggested she might have been kidnapped from her bed after the murders. Unfortunately, many hours had passed since her disappearance. The chance of anybody finding her nearby was slim to none. The murders of John, Sue, and Dana were notably vicious. Two bloody knives and one hammer were found at the scene. Uh, One of the knives, which was later determined to be a steak knife, had been bent at roughly 30 degrees, and that was the knife that Sheila had saw uh, earlier. Blood splatter evidence from inside the house indicated that the murders of Sue, John, and Dana had all taken place in the living room. Closest and parallel to the front door, supine on the floor, was Johnny's corpse. His finch, his feet were inches from the south wall, and his head was nearest the doorway. Inches away to his left lay the cheap, uh, the cheap steak, uh, table steak knife, which Sheila had noticed. Two feet away and parallel to Johnny's body was that of Dana Wingate. L- laying prone, the head was barely resting on the corner of a cushion, which had been removed from the couch. Sue was lying on her side near the living room sofa, nude from the waist down, and she had been gagged with a blue bandana and her own panties, which had been secured with tape. She had been stabbed in the chest. Her throat was stabbed horizontally. Uh, The wound went all the way through her larynx and nicked her spine. And on the side of her head was an imprint matching the butt of a Daisy 880 Powerline BB Pell rifle. It was reported that there were no signs of sexual assault. John's throat was slashed. Uh, Dana had multiple head injuries and and had been manually strangled to death. John and Dana further suffered blunt force trauma to their heads, which was caused by a hammer or possibly hammers. Whoa. whoa, whoa. She was naked from the waist down? Uh Uh-huh. And there was no signs of sexual assault? That's what they reported. Okay. Um, autopsies later determined that Sue and John died from the knife wounds and blunt force trauma, but Dana uh, by asphyxiation, as I had said, uh, it was evident that Sue had put up a fight during the attack because she had defensive wounds on her arm, but oddly, John and Dana did not have any defensive wounds or blood under their bindings, which to me says they were asleep. Uh, when well, his head was on the cushion. Mm hmm. Uh, Maybe Dana, were Dana, in the living room watching TV and fell asleep. Dana's head was on the cushion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I just, I don't know. It's kind of hard because I mean, Sue put up a fight, so it's kind of hard to figure out if she put up a fight. Would they have woken up, or did they get killed first, and then she put up a fight? It's kind of hard I, to figure I, out. I, yeah, I, th- I think. I think your second thought is is correct. I think they probably got killed and then she put up a fight when she got woke up. Maybe so. Maybe, yeah, because maybe she was asleep and she woke up after they were killed. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, because, um, I mean, yeah, a hammer's loud when it's hitting a nail, but I don't think it would be real loud if it hit somebody in the head. It's going to be a thud, though, for sure. Yeah, but, I mean, it's not, you know, if you're a deep sleeper, 
Um, Especially if the television was on. All I'm of, sorry, I'm just No, it's fine. Um all of the injuries that happened to John and Dana uh, appeared to happen after the killers tied them up. Oh. Yeah. So Well, that doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to cut. It's hard to really figure out the order that everybody was killed in, but Mm -hmm. it does make you think that multiple people had to be involved. Yeah. It is definitely not one person. No, because if it was just one person, I don't care how big they are. The three of them probably could have overpowered one person. Mm -hmm. Uh, The findings did confirm that the weapons used on the victim's head were two different hammers and a BB gun in Sue's case, as we had said. Uh, there was a plastic piece that police found in the cabin that matched up to a Daisy 80, 880 BB gun, which was how they determined that. And additionally, the same gun matched the impressions that the butt of the gun left on Sue's head. Uh, Sheila and the Seabolt family, you remember Sheila had been spending the night next door. They said they heard no commotion during the night. Mm-hmm. There was a couple who was living in nearby house 16 reported that muffled screams or groans woke them up between one and 2 a.m. Unfortunately, they couldn't determine where the sounds came from and they just went back to sleep. Tina's jacket, shoes and a toolbox containing various tools were missing from the house, which showed no indication of forced entry. So potentially somebody they knew. We know it wasn't the Seabolts. Potentially not the Seabolts. Correct. Because Sheila was over there all night. So. I don't know. Uh, Martin Smart, who was Justin Smart's uh, father, uh, he claimed that a claw hammer had inexplicably gone missing from his home. Uh, Plumas County Sheriff Sylvester Thomas, who presided over the case, later stated that Martin had provided endless clues in the case that seemed to throw the suspicion away from him. In addition to interviewing the Smarts, detective interviewed numerous other locals and neighbors. Several, including members of the Seabolt family, recalled seeing a green van parked at the Sharps' house around 9 o'clock p.m. Justin Smart, who had been staying at the house, uh, he gave conflicting stories of the evening, including that he had dreamed details of the murders, although he, he later claimed to have actually witnessed them. In his later account of events that were told under hypnosis, he claimed to have awoken to sounds coming from the living room while asleep in the bedroom with Rick and Greg. And investigating these sounds, he saw Sue with two men, one with a mustache and, and short hair, the other clean shaven with long hair and both wore glasses. According to Justin, Don, John and Dana then entered the home and began heatedly arguing with the men. A fight ensued after which Tina entered the room, was taken out the cabin's back door by one of the men. I don't know how true this can be or not. Was this a dream he had? Did he actually see it? But talking about the heatedly arguing with the man, if Sue and John and Dana were all alive at this point, you figure John and Dana are going to have defensive wounds. And we, and we discovered through the autopsies, they did not. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm not sure how much, how much stock to take in what Justin Smart thinks he saw. Yeah. Well, and he was a little kid too, right? Uh, it didn't, I don't know how little he was. I don't think I really saw that. He was he just was a friend out with the nine and the 10 year old. Right? Yeah. He, 10 year old. Right. Yeah. He was the friend of the younger ones. Yeah. So he could have been anywhere between five and 10 figure in there. Yeah. Yeah, man. If you woke up in the middle of the night in a place you weren't used to and saw something like that go down. Yeah. I could see how it would be disjointed. Well, based on Justin's description, composite sketches were uh, were ta- were, get- were gathered of the two men, um, and they were produced by Harlan Embry, who was a man with no artistic ability and no training in for- forensic sketching, which I thought was weird, because with access to the Justice Department and federal, you know, and FBI's top forensics artists, why did yeah. law enforcement choose an amateur who volunteered to help local police? It was weird. I can help. Right. Uh, In press releases that accompany the sketches, the suspects were being described as in their late 20s to early 30s. One stood between five feet, 11 to six feet, two with dark blonde hair. The other between five foot six and five foot 10 with black greased hair and both wore gray gold framed sunglasses. Like aviators. That's how that's how I imagined it. I'll need to yeah. find pictures because I'm sure there's pictures of the sketches uh, out that I can get for the show. So we can look at those. 
Uh, rumors regarding the crimes being ritualistic or motivated by drug trafficking were dismissed by uh, the county sheriff, Doug Thomas, who stated in the week following the murders that no drug paraphernalia or illegal drugs were found in the home. However, Carla McClellan, who was a family acquaintance, later told detectives that Dana Wingate had recently stolen an unknown quantity of LSD from local drug dealers, although she was unable to provide uh, proof of this claim. Oh, there was about 4,000 man hours spent working the case, uh, which Thomas described as uh, Sheriff Thomas described as frustrating. And in December of 1983, detectives ruled out serial killers Henry Lee Locus and Otis Toole as potential suspects because they were somewhere in the area. Tina's disappearance was initially investigated by the FBI's possible abduction, although uh, though it was reported on April 29th, 1981, that the FBI had backed off the search as the California State Department of Justice was doing an adequate job and made the FBI's presence unnecessary. They did a grid pattern search of the area covering a five-mile uh, radius around the house uh, that were also conducted with police canines, but the efforts ended up being fruitless. Wait, 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 wait. The FBI's like, oh, they're, hey, hey, they're doing a great job. They don't need us. Yep. When has that ever happened? In this case, right here. Okay. All right. I'm with you. Yep. On April 22nd, 1984, three years and 11 days after the murder, a bottle collector discovered the cranium portion of a human skull and part of a mandible at Camp 18 near Feather Falls in neighboring Butte County, which is roughly 100 miles from Ketty. Shortly after announcing the discovery, the Butte County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous call that identified the remains as belonging to Tina, but the call was not documented in the case. A recording of this call was found at the bottom of an evidence box at some point after 2013 by a deputy who was assigned the Kitty case. Uh, the identified caller said, quote, I was watching the news and they were talking about the girl found at Feather Falls. I was just wondering if you thought of the murder up in Ketty in Plumas County a couple of years ago where a 12 year old girl was never found. Uh, the remains were confirmed by a forensics pathologist to be those of Tina's in June of 1984. Near the remains, detective also discovered a blue nylon jacket, a blanket, a pair of Levi Strauss jeans with a missing back pocket and an empty medical tape dispenser. However, none of the invest evidence helped investigators find the killer or killers or determined how she died. It was, she was too, she was too decomposed by that point for them to figure out Scalping how she eyes. died. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's like three years later. Yeah. And it's really sad because the their initial theory was correct. She she was obviously kidnapped away from the scene yeah. and taken away where she was, you know, apparently then murdered. So there was a 2008 documentary on the murders and Marilyn Smart, who was Martin Smart's wife, said that Martin and his friend John Bo Bobede were responsible for the murders. Wow. Marilyn claimed that on the evening of April 11th, 1981, that she had left Martin and, and Bo at a local bar around 11 p.m. and then returned to go to sleep. Martin and Bo left the bar and then returned later wearing suits as if they had spent the evening at a business meeting. One theory is that they really wanted people to notice them. Around 2 a.m. on April 12th, she stated she awoke to find the two burning an unknown item in the wood stove. And additionally, she alleged that Martin hated Johnny Sharp with a passion. However, in the 2008 documentary, Sheriff Doug Thomas said that he had personally interviewed Martin and that he had passed a polygraph examination. Yeah, who cares? Right. I, and this is, the, this is the same guy that was throwing the investigators off with false clues. Yes, that's the exact same guy. Okay, I'm with you. Um, according to a 2016 article published by the Sacramento Bee, Martin had left Ketty and driven to Reno, Nevada shortly after the murders. From there, he sent a letter to Marilyn ruminating on personal struggles in their marriage, which he concluded with, quote, I've paid the price for your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. What else do you want? What? Yep. In a 2016 interview, um, the author stated that the evidence was overlooked in the initial investigation and never admitted it as evidence. He later criticized the quality of the initial investigation, 
and uh, uh, saying you could take someone ju- just out of the academy and they would have done a better job. Wow. Yeah. There was also a counselor who Martin regularly uh, visited also alleged that he had admitted to the murders of Sue and Tina, but claimed I didn't have anything to do with the boys. He allegedly told the counselor that Tina was killed to prevent her from identifying him and that she had witnessed the whole thing. Martin Smart, however, died of cancer in Portland, Oregon in June of 2000, and John Bobede, who allegedly allegedly had ties to organized crime in Chicago, died there in 1988. So, two suspects dead. On March 24, 2016, a hammer matching the description of the hammer Martin claimed to have lost was discovered in a local pond and taken into evidence by uh, Plumas County Special Investigator Mike Gamberg. Uh, Sheriff Hagwood, who was 16 years old at the time of the murders and knew the Sharp family personally stated, quote, the location it was found, it would have been intentionally put there. It would not have been accidentally misplaced. Both Gamberg and Hagwood say they're closer now to solving the case than ever before. And Gamberg said, quote, I believe there are two individuals that are alive and accessories after the fact. So he thinks there's more than just two. More than two of them. There's four of them. Yep. Agwood said, I quote, I think it would lift an incredible weight to clear the dark skies that have hung over that community and surviving family members. Uh, They've said that the surviving family members have been severely impacted by the case, as you would expect. Oh, yeah. Hagwood further said, quote, things came to an abrupt screeching halt, opportunities and experiences that were denied by such a cruel and heinous act. It's unforgivable. To solve this case, a weight would be lifted and darkness would no longer cloud Ketty in the mind of all those involved. Then in, t- in April of 2018, uh, Gamberg said that the DNA from the murder scene, uh, that, that, that there was DNA that matched on the murder scene to a known living suspect. But since then, no arrests have been made and the names have never been released to the public. Nevertheless, Gamberg says that six people may have been involved. Two of the suspects, Martin and Bo, of course, are died. Of the suspects who are still alive, Gamberg said, quote, they better batten down the hatches because we're coming. We're continuing the, the investigation and we're doing interviews and we have several persons of interest. I don't know how much interest it could be since that's been since 2018, though. That's four years, man. Yep. You know, three and a half, four years, uh, depending on when in 2018. Um, <sighs> to further confuse this case even further, Gamberg and the owner of Keddy28.com, who goes by the name DMAC, believe that Sue Sharp and Martin Sharp were having an affair. Gamberg thinks at the time that Sue was counseling Marilyn to leave Martin. Uh, but the author of kitty 28com doesn't believe that. He just believes that there was an affair. Um, some investigators believe Marilyn was somehow complicit in the murders. It does seem possible that Marilyn learned about the affair between Martin and Sue. You know, from the statement in Martin's letter, what else do you want? Sounds like Martin is asking, in, in addition to what you already asked for, what more do you want me to do? So almost yeah. making it sound like Marilyn said, her. go kill her. Yeah. Yeah, I killed her. What do you want? Now, what do you want? I killed her and a couple of kids. Uh, Marilyn did move out of cabin 26 the day after the murders, and she is remarried and still alive. Sue Sharp's surviving children left California to live with an aunt. Unfortunately, they later went into foster care as their aunt already had several children and couldn't handle any more. Sheila has spoken about the horrific incident in several interviews She mentioned, however, she doesn't talk to her brothers about it because she wants to protect them. Mm -hmm. Over the years, the Kitty Resort has fallen in disrepair, and in 2004, Cabin 28 was demolished, and the entire site has since been abandoned. The case is still considered open, and anyone with information is asked to call the Plumas County Sheriff's Office at 530-283-6360. And that is the story of the Kitty Cabin murders. Okay. I have a few questions. All right. Um, so the, my first question was motive. So is it possible that the lady and the sharp guy had an affair? That's, that's the main motive. That's one of the big motives or that that's one of the motives. Yeah. 
Uh, another and- another motive is it was it was part of a of of a, of a drug of a drug deal gone bad. Oh yeah, because that Dana kid that it wasn't right. a member of the family, but he was also killed. Um, had stolen some LSD from some local drug dealer and supposedly, yeah. Well, okay, so that kind of makes sense with the six people. Yeah, but I, I I go back to the whole thing about Martin and and Bo when they went to that bar. So dressed I, up in suits just so they would. Well, re- remember they left and then mm-hmm. they came back wearing suits. Yeah. Why? Weird. And then what were Why? they what were they burning in the wood stove? Yeah. So, you know, was that was that murder weapons? Was was that uh, pieces of clothing? Bloody. Sure. Clothing? Yeah, sure. Bloody clothing that they had. It didn't say that Marilyn woke up and they were still wearing the suits. No. So I, I, I do think that Martin and Bo had something to do with this. And they, you know, they said that Martin hated Johnny Sharp. Well, hated him enough to kill him. Um, well, and, and is how, it, how bad can he hate Johnny Sharp? I mean, uh, I don't know. That's just that that's what Marilyn stated. Um, I, but I kind of think wasn't Johnny Sharp a kid? He, I mean, he was fifteen. Yeah. Um. So who knows with that? I I think there may be a little something to, if not the affair, at least at least that she suspected the the affair, mm-hmm. and that Martin couldn't claim otherwise, and so she said, "Well, if you want to stay with me, then you better kill her." Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I th- this whole this whole case is so weird, and there's so many ins and outs that that go with it. There's no there there. It's really too hard to pinpoint any one thing. I I I'd, I'd really love to hear a conclusion. To this I'd love to hear about these uh, these persons of interest that they suppose. <gasps> She's naked from the waist down. Yes. There is no sign of sexual assault, right? According to the reports, correct. Okay. So and this is a thought that just crossed my mind. So he comes over. They've been having an affair. She starts to take off her clothes. The kids come in. His people come in. The kids get bound. He kills her. They kill the kids. They leave. Maybe, maybe. So, so yeah. So y- you may be right. They may have already been in the act of killing Sue when the kids came in. So they were quickly grabbed and bound, which would eliminate the eliminate the the the, the fight or the struggle. Yeah, yeah and no. they couldn't bring themselves to kill the twelve year old girl, so they took her with them and killed well, her later. They yeah they well they 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 did bring themselves to kill her because yeah she may have witnessed everything and so they took yeah. her away. I don't know why taking I don't know why take her away and kill her unless unless you're right they couldn't they couldn't do it they at had, first they had to work up enough courage like when they showed up to the place in suits she could have been in the back of the van yeah that green van right yeah well. Did either one of them own a green van? I didn't see any information on that. Okay. All right. Hmm. I just, I'm trying to get the, the, the I'm trying to get the, the, the sequence of events down in my brain and nothing makes sense. Right. Right. A whole lot of this, a whole lot of this murder doesn't make any sense. It's yeah. It's, and, and how much of this is down to, you know, the, some of the information we have is because of a, botched police investigation oh i think there's a lot i think there's a lot of it that was botched in the police investigation Yeah, because it sounds like it's an entire police force manned by barney fife i would agree i would agree and and it's a small town so you know probably didn't have a whole lot of experience in this kind of stuff which which we see yeah i mean but you got stadies you know the stadies especially in california they've dealt with some serious serious stuff well, sure, they have, but if the Plumas County police had already botched the scene, 
Yeah, what can the Sadies do? That's a good right. point. Same with the FBI. It's like they've already fucked this up. Maybe. This has already been fucked up. There's nothing we can do. And maybe that's why the FBI bailed on it. Yeah, because uh, they didn't want to be associated with it. Who knows? Good, uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, sir. Like that a whole lot. Thank you for sitting with me through sure. uh, a, a murder that has haunted me for a long time. I've known this story for quite a long time. Oh, wow. Uh, and I, it's been on my list of ones I wanted to cover because I've just felt it was kind of a particularly haunting one. So thanks for sitting through through that sure. with me. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for the brain teaser. <laughs> you bet. Now, <laughs> now, now, now you can live with it and I can let it go away for a while. That's right. Get it out of your head. Yep. All right. So with that, it takes us to the end of another recording week. Uh, as always, you can find our information on nerderymurder.com. You can find links to this episode as well as pictures from this episode. I will try to find pictures of the sketches uh, to, to put on here as well so everybody can see that. Uh, you can also find the links to our social media and our email addresses. So if you'd like to contact us, let us know things you want to hear, things you don't want to hear. We're always interested in hearing that. You can also find the link to our merchandise on our page, where if you wish to show off your nerdery and murdery fandom, you can certainly get your logo merchandise there and show off to all your friends and family how much, how much, how much of fans you are. Uh, it's also free advertisement for us. I'll take that. Yes. Yes. Uh, you can also find the link to our patron, our Patreon on our website, where if you become a patron, you do get access to our episodes early as well as exclusive episodes. We will have information from those exclusive episodes on our website, but the actual episode themselves are, are solely for our patrons. So if you wish to have access to those, please do consider donating. It really does help our show. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. And finally, please do remember to leave a rating and review where you can. It really helps us. It helps get our content out to other people. And it's something completely free that you can do that only takes about a minute or two of your time. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I've been Jeffrey with your murdery. Cue the music. Music.